Hi, Nicole. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with Nicole Sahin, who is founder and CEO of Globalization Partners, which is a Boston-based firm with global reach. Um, we're going to talk about how to eliminate barriers to doing business internationally and building global teams. Um, Nicole's uh, Boston-based company, I mentioned that, uh, empowers companies to hire anyone anywhere within a few business days, expanding their global footprint without the need to set up country branch offices. Um, Nicole also has a long career with another firm, High Street Partners, in global work and supports um, uh, many nonprofit endeavors, including School the World, which spearheads efforts in helping uh, build schools in rural communities in Guatemala and Cambodia. Um, welcome, Nicole. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. This might not be on. Testing not sure. the mic. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Suddenly great. Suddenly you're you. here. Um, so could you tell us to start with um, a little bit about the company you founded and what it does? It seems very much like you're about building bridges and not walls. Thank you. Say. Yeah, I love that expression. Um, so Globalization Partners is a company that helps other companies expand internationally. And what that usually means is that we're helping people hire their team members overseas. So if our usually our clients are hiring salespeople, most often. And normally, the business protocol is like they want to hire two people in the UK or one guy in Dubai or you know, one or two people in Brazil and one or two people in Malaysia. Now, if any of you have been in that seat, you know that it's really hard in the traditional way of doing it to figure out all the laws in that country, all the tax issues, how to run payroll, um, and it's just really intimidating. So when setting up the company, what we do is that whenever companies find the person that they want to hire, we put that person on our locally compliant payroll and benefits in that country and bill the cost of employment to the client from our U.S. company. So from the client's perspective, it's a U.S. company to U.S. company contract, but we're making sure that the employee is legally paid, happy with his or her employment, getting a pay slip, and like everything's taken care of from an administrative perspective on the back end. Um, we offer that service in 175 countries. We support about 700 companies doing, doing that, about 500 active right now. Um, and internally, I've had to drink my own Kool-Aid a little bit. As you can imagine, just having all these companies all over the globe, we also have employees all over the globe. And uh, for me, it's really important to build a cohesive company culture and to, that people enjoy their work. I think it's really important for people to be engaged in their work and like love the company. And when I set up the company, I actually really love the theme of this conference. And I love that it, it's become in the last five years a common topic to talk about how to build a company that isn't only focused on profits for shareholders. The uh, last company I worked with, I loved. We helped, it, we were consulting to companies that were expanding around the globe. And at some point we took venture capital and as soon as we took venture capital, like everything changed from being this high growth, really fun company where people were really excited to be involved and build something to like all we were worried about was the bottom line all the time. And everything about the dollars mattered. And when I started this company, besides wanting to help companies go global in a much different way to make things easier, I thought if we could do it in a way that uh, is not only good for the shareholders, but prove that you can have a high growth highly profitable business while also creating a company that people love that we would have really accomplished something. Let's take a biographical step back to the creation story of your company, which was really interesting. It, you traveled around the world and as kind of a cultural anthropologist in a sense, but what you saw made you get back into entrepreneur mode, right? And seeing a real need around the world. Can yes. you tell a little bit about your, your journey? Sure, yeah, I think I've always been a traveler and what has always intrigued me about people is, um, first of all, I think I am really on a personal level interested in economic development, but I don't believe in, I don't always believe in philanthropy in terms of just like giving stuff away. I think that people like to work and everybody wants to earn what they do and they wanna feel rewarded for it. Um, and so at some point I just realized like I'm not meant to be a, a philanthropist like only a philanthropist, I'm meant to build things. And I can create a good, a good outcome for, for people in the world by creating a positive employee experience for people. And I think that's just a better thing for me. But- um, And you felt that that's kind of like a universal truth around the world. There'd be huge cultural differences, but people want to 
be paid on time and various other things that they And people just want to work. Like, I yeah. think it's part of our core motivating thing as humans, that we want something to be involved in. I think that in, in societies and families where people aren't engaged, like maybe they're wealthy and they don't have like a social mission as a family or something that they really believe they have to contribute to, they, uh, they're not as inspired, they're not living deeply. I think people need something to wake up and accomplish something every day. And there, our primary way of doing that, you know, as a, as a human race is through our work. Mm -hmm. So um, I think putting that to work and motivating and inspiring people results in a much more engaged workforce no matter where you are in the world. Now, globalization in the last few years has kind of gotten a bad name, you know, even among the Davos crowd uh, and, and certainly politically in this country. And outsourcing is, a, is a, another thing that that's takes a, a bad route. But you're doing something that's kind of the flip side, and there's a phenomenon here of growing markets overseas for U.S. companies, and which creates more jobs here and there. Right. Um, can you talk about that dynamic, uh, just, just in the... In the sort of global economic sense for sure. the US? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's really been interesting. So one thing about being 40 now is that like, you get to look at the trends over, over history and time, and it's just fun to like, see how the world changes so quickly. So, so just so the younger people in the audience know they have something to look forward to uh, about getting older, because I don't know how, much other, how many other things there really are. But um, basically, the, uh, yeah, so, so right after the bubble burst in early 2000s, people were really trying to uh, reduce the cost of employing people globally. So everybody was setting up these huge outsourcing centers in India and China, and don't get me wrong, people still do that, but I think they subcontract it rather than try to build it in-house because it's really hard to do it in-house. More often than not, our clients are hiring, about 80% of the time I'd say, our clients are hiring salespeople internationally, um, which as you mentioned, is really about exporting. So these are high growth American companies that want to take advantage of the huge market opportunity that exists internationally. So the US is only 20-ish percent of the world's total economic economy. And I think there's two things here. One, with the speed at which, uh, with the speed at which ideas fly around the globe, if companies don't go after global market share fast, if they have a good idea and they don't get it, they're gonna lose the opportunity. So if you look at China, China has, it's like, I don't know, a quarter, quarter of the world's people um, Uber didn't move fast enough into China. They didn't have a good enough, like a localized enough plan. And I was in China just a couple weeks ago, and guess what? There is no Uber, there is no Messenger. People use WeChat to pay for everything. They have Didi, and it works fabulously. And it's basically the exact same businesses that we have here. So I think in pretty much any industry in the US, you have to go, you have to go after it fast to get it because of how quickly ideas and people move around the globe. And second, if you only go after 20% of the world market, you're leaving so much on the table. And, and your best companies, investors, and entrepreneurs are just not, they don't want to do it. Now, um, one part of the uh, employment economy we're seeing reach kind of its limits uh, is the gig economy, right? In terms of uh, the poster boys, of course, are Uber and Lyft, and there's, there's legislation in California now to, to um, push them toward hiring their people. Um, are you? when you're doing your work, are you creating gig jobs, gig economy jobs overseas, or are you actually creating jobs where people have health care or other benefits? We're creating great jobs overseas. I mean, most of our clients are American headquartered companies who are hiring highly professional skilled people who speak English, both you know our language so they can communicate with headquarters and also a local language so they can sell into their local market. Um, and I think for an American company, like once you find that talent in another country, you really want to keep them because it's so hard to find those right, the right people. And I think that's why investing in culture, making sure you get paid is, is one thing. Like that's, that should be the bare bones and it's really hard to do if you're, if you're doing it. But like beyond that, integrating people in. And I think that's really the focus of something you wanted to talk about, which is how do you build that culture and pull people into the company mm -hmm. from day one. Do you, um, do you find that in representing American companies who are, are expanding overseas, do you have to, um, well, this gets into something that you talk about, which is the triple bottom line. Do you need to kind of school them at some times? If they're going to go and operate in another country, they need to like meet standards there in multiple ways? 
Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely. So, I mean, I think that there's, it goes both ways. Like we want the team members in country to, to meet our standards, which is I think one of the most intimidating things about having people around the globe. We, we don't know if they're ultimately, you know, you don't know if somebody's gonna treat your clients the way you would want to and, or anything. And so when you have one person in a country and they're responsible for everything, it can be a little scary. But I think, it, I think that most people want to do a good job but what I find actually is the benefit is when we listen to them and they're schooling us a little bit. So for example, um, I was in Brazil a few weeks ago meeting with our team there and they told me that um, like they have to meet anybody who works for us in country for, for our clients. They meet them in person just to get them comfortable with the model, to talk them through the benefits and it just brings comfort to people to meet in person. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in a lot of countries things are m more relationship based a lot of times when people work for foreign companies internationally, losing some of that face-to-face -face and human interaction that comes along with normal work life can be really challenging for people. Um, we, one thing that we, we really recommend strongly is always keeping our videos on. So even mm -hmm. if I'm calling somebody at like 7.30 in the morning, I typically will FaceTime them, which everybody loves hearing from there. CEO like early in the morning FaceTime, but you know, I'm wearing a baseball hat too and like, and, and like that's just the nature of the beast. But the difference in communication when you can actually see someone's face is so much better that it's worth doing. Now it's worth doing for me, and I speak English, which, which is the, the business language everyone speaks. But imagine how much more important it is if for it's a, a Thai national who's speaking English as their second language and they're dialing in across time zones. They don't know you that well. English is the second language and it's much harder. They need to not only read body language but also Lip, lip read a little bit. So I think in, in some of the nuances in language are really important that come from that type of mandate. Here's a, is something that uh, occurred to me in terms of your company having global reach and your actual employees here in the United States or even here in Boston. A lot of people aren't following the career paths of up the ladder that they used to. It's really more what's more creative and, and that's one of the things we talk about here. It's like lateral moves, enriching moves. It's about um, really life experience thing? Is that something that you're finding as you're hiring people here in the U.S. that they want those kinds of opportunities to go to Mexico City for you or yeah. Beijing? Yeah, absolutely. And so one thing, I mean, people, I mean, a couple of years ago, the big topic on panels is like, what do you think about millennials? I love millennials because I think these are people who want to be passionate about their work. They're not signing up for the mandate that we're all going to work until we're 65 and then suddenly it's going to be like this amazing retirement. People want to be engaged and really interested in and inspired by their life, by their work their entire lives. And I think they're just being honest and being human and I think that's how you get the best out of people anyway, not by just like forcing people to sit at, sit at a desk and like be widgets. Um, so, so yeah, I think, and what I found that is, you know, I mean, if you're providing somebody with a good job in, in a, a, a developing country where it's like a really good job in a developing country, one thing that our, our teams in Mexico and Indoor, for ex India, for example, have explained to us is like they're really shocked that the CEO and the COO show up and like want to hear their ideas and are, you know, asking them what's going on. We think it's incredibly important. These are our team members, just like our team members in Boston. But what shouldn't have surprised me but does is they want the exact same things our team members in, in, in Boston was and like listening to their dreams about I just really want to travel you know and like I my dream is to go to Boston and meet the headquarters team and like people want to travel they want they have the same dreams anyone else does they have the same same dreams everywhere and also really talented people everywhere it's incredible oh, that's great um, yeah. one thing um, that you must navigate and have some real adventures in is is the complex tax um, systems and regulatory systems in places that are like uh, complex in different ways than the U.S. is. Like for example, in Latin America, I just had friends and family where they were trying to do projects or things like that, and and it was really hard to figure out who to pay and how to make something work. And how how do you adapt to countries that are different, but not be condescending about the fact that you know you can't buy a copy machine there or something like mm -hmm. that, and which is one particular case. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and there is even you know 
money, money laundering issues, all kinds of kind of yep. other complexities. That's super complicated. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, for, for international law and dealing with the international tax issues, that's the primary function of our platform. So because the clients are dealing with us, they don't have to set up a company in country. They're not declared as a business doing business in country. So like we pay us, we pay the employees. Legally, they're our employees. But for all other reasons, they're the client's employees. You know, they're on the client's email address and they're part of their team. Mm -hmm. So we're just the administrator and all of that goes away on behalf of our clients. Um, we make it as simple as possible, but it's still complicated sometimes. Um, and for example, you know, if we have to fire somebody in France, it's gonna be three to six months severance. Nobody likes hearing that. We try to set up the, set the client's expectation in advance, but, um, and we do. But you know, it's like these types of, again, even though you eliminate, we eliminate the admin stuff, and I think that's a huge headache lifted from our clients, but there's all the other stuff, which actually I think is the adventure and fun of it in many ways, you know, like the, the mm -hmm. cross-cultural communication differences, they drive everyone crazy, but it's like the best stories for cocktail parties. Um, speaking of which, then um, I'm curious, like, is a, uh, love to hear an example of a company that you help navigate, you know, in other countries to like get those people, you know, get those people hired, build up the presence there, and then maybe even graduate from your company because you, you built them up so much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, we, we've helped a lot of um, high growth companies over the years, and I think my our favorite companies are like the high growth companies that everybody's heard the name, and it's like you're on the ride with them, and they're they're not only excited about you know about the fact that they can hire people around the globe, but they're they're trying to build something, and I think the contagious energy of that and of trying to build a truly global team is really exciting and something we love being part of. Um, one of my favorite clients was Magento. So uh, Magento spun out from eBay about a couple, about two and a half, three years ago. It was three and a half years ago now. Anyway, for $150 million. And they started by hiring, they had like one or two people in the UK, a couple people in Germany. And they employed those people through us so that they didn't have to figure out how to set up companies in those countries. This company took off like a rocket. And in the course of two and a half years, they had, I think about 80 people employed through us in about 20 something countries. And basically, they called at one point and they said, look, you guys are able to get employees on board in a couple business days in any country. If you can do it overnight, for every three days, you can get an employee on board faster in any given country for us. It represents a million dollars in revenue. So like, we're not trying to be a pain to your client services team, but we are trying to push things as fast as we can and grow as fast as we can. And ultimately, um, they sold for $1.8 billion two and a half years after the original spin out from eBay. So it was this huge success story. They never had to deal with any of the legal or HR issues associated with global expansion. They didn't have any subsidiaries, they didn't have any tax issues. And we were really proud of it because when the employees transferred over to Adobe, um, there were no issues with due diligence, like all the IP from that those employees had created transferred mm -hmm. over. So like, I think it's, it was to me a, a, a proof point that this platform that we'd built to help clients expand globally actually did work and could help like the best companies in the world meet the standards that they needed to integrate into these huge fortune you know 1000 companies um, here, here's, a, here's a question which is like we are going through immense changes in our country uh, culturally and politically at the moment uh, one of them is of course has been the the me too movement and um, how does that translate overseas? Are you finding like, okay, here in the United States, everybody's now on alert and we're gonna see how this unfolds, but in some other places, maybe they're backward and do you, do you try to export American culture to those places or? That's a great question. Um, first of all, I would say like in terms of the US, I am seeing like structural change. Like I think organizations have, have I think Me Too has had a great impact in the business community and that people mm -hmm. are changing very quickly. Um, and I know it's not showing up in the data as quickly as we want it to because we want it to happen right now. You know, we want diversity yesterday. But it, it takes time, but I think people have become so conscious of it in the last two years that it's having a huge impact. Internationally, um, let's see, are we exporting American values? I think Europe has pretty strong values in terms of diversity and inclusion. Uh, Latin America is really harder because it's such machismo cultures. Um, and, and like the thing is, is that women have always worked in these places. It's just that they're less likely to be promoted into positions of leadership and power. Mm -hmm. We try to take the approach as an American business. Um, for example, we have an Asian woman who's running our office in the Middle East, you know, and like, it's fine. 
she does a great job, and that's not unheard of. Um, but uh, you know, occasionally we need to have somebody fly over from headquarters to support her if she's meeting with someone really senior in the government. And we're willing to make that investment because she's amazing and, and great. With our international offices, um, I, I occasionally tap my managers on, on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, if we, ha we already have two male leaders in that office, we should really try that our next leader in that office is female. Um, racial diversity is harder to do internationally. I'm not sure if that's as much of a thing, just because I think one thing with our society is we are so racially, there's such racial diversity, but not, not, the socio not at the socioeconomic stratum that it should be, mm -hmm. yeah. We have a, about, about a minute left. Um, since you're, you know, have so many global outposts and have traveled so much yourself, what are you, what, could you give us a quick tour of the world in sure. terms of like what you're seeing in terms of changes in China, who we're having a trade war with, and, um, and uh, maybe Latin America and, and Asia, just to give people a high level, quick high sure. level view. Sure. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I don't think there's probably a CEO around or a farmer in America who would agree, wouldn't agree that, like, not to be political, but trade war is not going to help us with China, with China or with our own economy. It's, it's a total disaster. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that that goes away. Um, and Chi I was in China just a few weeks ago, and I was shocked. So I was in Shanghai 20 years ago is the first time I went. I was there, and I was in there in Beijing, both Shang Shanghai and Beijing, 20 years ago, seven years ago, and a couple weeks ago and probably a few times in between. The amount of change that has happened in that time is complete insanity. Like, China is so organized. They don't have to deal with democracy. They don't have to deal with, like, eminent domain issues. Everything's about the collective. And they have plenty of money, and they're investing hard, fast, and furious. It's like 30% of their cars are electric vehicles. A condo in Beijing is a million dollars. Society has risen, and they have their own economy. They kind of don't need the rest of the world, which is really interesting historically, as well as, you know, kind of where they are now. Um, China's not a developing country anymore, and they have lifted 650 million people out of extreme poverty in like 10 years. It is a miracle of our generation, and just something really cool to witness. Um, I think that there's other countries as well. I think it's, it's uh, I guess one thing is, is that there is development happening all over the globe. One issue that I care about a lot is ending extreme poverty in the course of our generation. I think it's an incredible opportunity that we have and a mandate that we've given ourselves through the, the World Bank. Um, and it's, it's changing really quickly. We're down to less than 10% of people being experiencing extreme poverty all over the world. So, you know, sometimes I think we can watch the news and think the world's coming to an end. But if you look at the long-term data, or even the data over our generation, it's actually really remarkable what we're accomplishing. And there's a lot of work to be done, but we're doing it. Well, thank you. I feel like we had a little tour of the globe without leaving the room. Thank so, you. Uh, it's great. Thank you, Nicole. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Awesome.